let's talk about Zwei. I'll admit, I never expected the show to gain an animal mascot, but the little guy's proven to be a good source of humour and fun. His introduction brought his more cat-like nature out of Blake for a good laugh, as did Weiss's reception of the dog, and it brought a good charming relationship between him and Ruby, showing off more of Ruby's young energetic heart, and touching on the fact that she is still young. Let's also remember the Corgi Flaming Fastball Special with Ublek, who he also seems to have a nice partnership with. I do hope though that he's not going to be overplayed. He's not really a plot important character, and I think with how much he got screen time in the final third of the volume, I think it's time that he needs a breather. So keep him more of a minor role for the moment, until maybe we see Tai Yang in person. From animals to adults, let's now focus on the teachers. Professor Paul didn't have too much to do besides being a background face and aiding with the grammar a little, which at least did give a glimpse of how he uses his blunderbuss axe, but honestly it's okay since he had a larger presence in Volume 1, and he wasn't the teacher that needed the bigger focus. That went to Ublek, who I must say, while I was hoping to see more of him besides being the caffeinated eccentric that he is, I didn't expect what we saw from him this time out. He still showed signs that he's still a little too fast for his own good, even having to repeat his point at some times. And he's still quite the zippy greenhead chap, but wow, we got a very wise and grounded side to him this time out, serving as both the source of knowledge regarding Mountain Glen, which, as I previously mentioned, did a great job giving the area some majorly effective weight to it, but he was also the kicker into seeing more sides to his students that tied into some of their personal targets. Not to mention, we saw that he wasn't as loony as his speedy Gonzalez traits might make people believe. Touching on the tragedy of Mountain Glen, amongst many other examples, to why while he may be a skilled huntsman, he finds his greatest worth in using the lessons to be gained from such mistakes to better those still alive and the next generation, and give his life some worth beyond the battlefield. In just a few episodes, he went from being a nutty comedic minor role to someone with much more intrigue to him. And of course, he still had time to be a tad goofy, and we got one hell of a unique weapon from him with his thermo slash flamethrower baton. Beyond him, there was also the quite interesting three way between Ospin, Glinda, and new boy James Ironwood. The world's seemingly resident Tin Man brought some effective and in some ways needed additional story points for the Beaconhead duo. The General's definitely made an impact, with actions that's put him in charge now, and Ospin's career in doubt. But while it's probably actions that could be seen as ill-intended, it's quite clear that it's moves that James felt he had to do within good intention. We were privy for most of the volume in seeing that he's clearly not being an avid supporter of many of Ospin's approaches to the incoming threat, and while the relationship between them seems to have been successful in the past, this instance has been the breaking point. James being the one cutting away from the trio, Glinda having tried to be the mediating force between the two, and Ospin trying to soothe his friend's concerns as he continues his moves. Now we got someone who's not as easily fond to being the cautious observer, and while Ospin's tried to scope out what it is the villains have up their sleeves to make sure they know what it is they're dealing with, and hopefully retort with as little casualties as possible, James is the kind of guy who, in what we've seen so far, is someone who's not shy of having his opening hand be a strong one, despite not knowing the retaliation that it might bring. Granted, he could do so without the risk of losing allies, but it's clear at least from first glance the guy does have good intentions at heart and he does feel saddened that it came to the direction it did in the end. No doubt his plans will be tested when Cinder unleashes her own, and we know that he has Penny as a possible ace in the hole, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of man the General is when he's the one being tested, especially when it seems that some of his toys have been borrowed. He also brought out a side of Glinda that we haven't seen before. Okay, granted it's not the first time we've seen her annoyed, be it with her profession or some of the antics of some of the students, but it was annoyance that looks to have come from some sort of history behind it, when it comes to James Ironwood at least. Glinda comes off as the kind of woman who's very professional in social affairs, as much as she is when it comes to her work. But when Ironwood arrived, her reception was rather sour, and it seems to stem from the General's more aggressive nature, definitely ruffling her feathers, enough for Osborne to cut her off at one point for her to cool down. 
and yet there is a side of her that does want to help settle the situation that rises up between her two colleagues, when we see later on her trying to understand James's frustrations while trying to lower his own, through her own trust in Ozpin, and it at least topped off her role decently, showing more to her beyond the Huff's manners and hocus pocus. To the silver-haired head of the school, and while he did maintain a flavour similar to another well-known headmaster and getting involved at times with his students' plans, we had James give a conflicting face for Ospin's actions to be contested with, and while we yet to see a real reaction from Ironwood going behind his back with the council reports, we can assume that he's at least not pleased with it, so it'll be fun to see how he indeed retorts to it come any backlash Ironwood might face through Cinder's not acting on their own plans. We did get to witness some more of the compassionate nature from Volume 1 returning this time, when trying to aid Blake and understand and confront her frustrations, knowing full well that she's a faunus in hiding, and chances are also being aware that she's a former White Fang. Even when his offer of support was turned down, he didn't flinch. He looked like he understood why and respected it, but made clear that he remains concerned and that the offer is still on the table. Then later on, he tried to drive into Ruby a point that the job that she and the others love to make means that you might need to make the most of the moments you have, doing so with some sincerity and even trying to kindly repeat his point when Ruby didn't get it the first time out. Beyond all the mystery of the man, he does at least show that he cares for his students, no matter their race or their situation. And even if that wasn't enough, we got a slightly cheeky side when he was with Team Ruby, making it very clear that he's on the know of their previous antics, and does play along, only while making it clear that he's given the girls his approval, so long as they know what they're heading in for, and that they're being watched for their safety. It's all in the end bundled up Ospin having a positive volume for me. I want to quickly mention now Junior and his associates Militia and Melanie Malachite. Honestly, I was rather disappointed with their role this volume. There are not the lot shown in the opening sequence, even being alongside the main villains, and it ultimately overplayed their volume to standing. But in contrast to Sage and Scarlet, who got opening time as well, but only ended up playing background coverage, I think these three got it worse. Yes, Sage and Scarlet didn't really truly debut, but when you compare it to Junior and the Twins, I'd say they got off better, since the only scene Junior and the two girls were a part of really didn't serve any purpose just confirming that Yang coming to the club in her trailer took place before the show's present events. She's not afraid to go back to him to get information, knowing she can basically walk the yard without any danger. And in the end, the only info she and Neptune got was that the men that Roman hired and had on hand in the show's first episode didn't come back, even being killed like Tuxin, or at the very least are in jail. Junior just wasn't utilized decently in this volume for me and the twins only ended up being around for Neptune's eye to catch them and try to flirt with them. I think that's overall worse being in the volume speaking but having no importance, than being in the intro as well but not being used. Which is a shame as I kinda like the banter that Junior has with Yang, sort of the big man getting pushed over by the younger but tougher girl, and the twins were very skilled fighters in the yellow trailer. It seems now though that they're out of the loop when it comes to the plans of Cinder's crew, which I hope doesn't mean that it's the last we'll see of them. The idea of an underground spot where information on anything can be gained is a fun concept, so I hope the trio return and have something more concrete next time out. But now we got the remainder of the bad guys to chat about. Firstly, Roman Tortric. God, he's still so much fun to watch. The more active role he had on screen this time out, not dampening his charisma in the slightest and we finally got to see him play off some equally ill-intended units. Because while it's still fun watching him play around with Blake or Ruby, it's nice that with, say, Mercury or Cinder, we got faces that can snap back at his cheeky wit with some of their own, and it makes for a nice bit of a combustible element, and gives Roman more to him having to see him deal with being second banana, or having to catch up with someone's insults. Plus, later on, we saw his silver tongue used to win over a large groove of human hate and fullness in no time at all, going from members blasting his very appearance at the event to him having sold them into the cause and playing right into his and Cinder's hands. This volume also gave him a right-hand woman in the form of Neo, and while we didn't see the two play off each other that much, we did get a slight sign that Neo is quick to come to his aid, 
and it does give the idea that the two are a capable pair, if the two are able to work well enough to get out of dodge quick enough. Though the most interesting relationship for the white suited sneak is definitely with Cinder. We don't know why he's a part of their cause, but we get the feeling that he's very aware of the power that she has, and while he's not exactly shy to raise his voice, and try and get a better grasp of what his efforts are actually going towards, he's smart enough to know when not to push your buttons too much. More so out of concern for himself, I feel, than respect for Cinder. One does wonder what it is that's keeping him wanting in on this big gig with the hurdles he's forced to face. Enough for him to seemingly be fine with being a fall guy and being in the prison hold of Ironwood. In the end, Roman had for me an even stronger volume this time out and was never a failed inclusion in the scene. I doubt it's the last we'll see of him, so I do wonder what his next move might be and if it might call upon Neo, who, going on to her now, definitely made one hell of a debut impact. Even if to some, Roman's fine not needing a partner, it's clear that Neo is more than what her very small stature might make you think. Let's touch on one big topic of her, her lack of chatter in this volume. Grey has confirmed that she indeed has a voice actress, but even if she's not a mute like many often attribute her as being, She's definitely a unique one with how soft-spoken she is, despite being so confident in her poise in combat, not even a grunt came out of her when she fought. The design, if I can quickly praise it, is probably one of my favourites, especially with the mix of her namesake's colours feeding into a rather stylish getup, that also seems to mask some of her nature and her powers are so exciting to see her use. Her eyes change colour in combat, which definitely leads to the belief that it's a sign of a semblance power and use, like when Yangs go red. She at one point uses a mirror-like mirage to distract Yang and get her and Roman out of the battlefield, and then later on to redirect a blow back at the same girl. But she also takes a hike with a teleport when Raven pops in, making her the only person so far shown being capable of using perhaps more than one semblance. But beyond that, her combat skills are insane. So agile, so nimble, and so smooth in motion. In one fight, she took on one of the toughest fighters we've seen in the show in Yang and played her like a puppet, flawlessly working around the fact that Yang's semblance comes from not just her physical strength, but also the power she gains after taking blows so long as she can return fire. Neo was dodging heavy attacks constantly and adding to Yang's frustrations, all while giving off so much physical personality in her movements and dealing the knockout blow. It was definitely one of the highlights of the volume, and even then we saw another side for her that's rather vicious. As beyond a lack of a busy voice box in her small frame, she has a nature of wanting to get the job done good when looking to shish kebab Yang in a rather brutal fashion. Of course, she failed, but then that leads into Raven and Neo's reaction. From the shocked and sort of scared look on her face, you have to wonder if she has a history with the mysterious woman, enough to make her hightail it, or at least does she know her. But whatever that may be, I cannot in good conscience say I was bored with Miss Neo. And she definitely had a very exciting debut this volume. And now from the cool girl to the hot gal, Miss Cinder Fall. Finally in the spotlight, and we got the chance to see what it is she's like, at least for the most part. For starters, we can definitely tell that she's the boss in more than just a position with her commanding presence just stepping into the room. The moment she did so during Roman and her two cohorts bickering, the mood changed and the issue momentarily diffused. She put her foot down on her allies acting out of line and showed some restrained annoyance with Roman while trying to comfort his curiosity with a thinly veiled threat behind some comforting words and fiery eyes. It's shown later on too that while she could no doubt talk the authoritative game, she would later showcase more sides to her combat nature than what we saw in the first episode of the show. Able to handle up close combat with her own fierce and agile touch, having the interesting skill of using dust crystals as ranged fire, and being able to form weapons from dust embedded cloves, being the first in the show to do so. She's not been truly tested to her limits, but it's enough so far to know that she's definitely not playing the ringmaster while her associates do the fighting for her. It would be nice though to see her more roiled up or angered, a chance to see her shaken up, as so far we've not seen her with a bit more venom or heat to her voice. She's been rather calm and collected, even when caught off guard by either Ruby 
or the plan spring in a tad early. This should come down the line, but it's something I hope we do see soon. But it's good to see that she at least is being shown as much as a big threat to a lot of people as she is being touted as. And while we got just the four remaining heroes to go on, let's have a quick talk about two late entries to the volume, Adam and Raven, starting with Blake's former partner. At last, he finally made a present day appearance, and his place is shown as working alongside Cinder and Co as the new representative for the White Fang in her group. Still looking to be in the same mindset that he was in the Black trailer, working against people like the Schnee Company and humans, be it for whatever personal reason he may have. And with his introduction to the show at last, we can expect he'll bring some big drama when it comes to his former partner. Will Blake desert him mean that he's against her, or perhaps will he try to win her back into the White Fang fold? And how will her friends be calling the crossfire of him returning into her life? It'll give Blake a new personal target with Roman in prison, and will no doubt be her biggest challenge yet, and we'll get to see more of who Adam really is. His arrival ended up being a very effective stinger to the volume, though of course not being the only one. Raven Branwyn, the mystery sword wielding, teleporting, grim mass wearing Yang lookalike. I will admit I'm very surprised they touched on who the masked woman was so soon after she arrived, and like I said in the episode review, I really do throw into question that entire scene. But before that, whoever she is, she still made a strong impact, rocking one of the more unique and interesting designs, akin to a samurai of sorts, and having a tasty looking weapon, sort of like a multicoloured pen but with a sword function, and possible multiple properties to her blades. And of course, her coming to Yang's aid opens up the doors to whoever she may be, even further so in the final shot of the volume when she apparently takes off the mask and looks very much like Yang just with black hair. But again, something about the scenes directing, the music and just the overall tone definitely feels off and I still think it may very well be a dream sequence or red herring in some other way. We only know what her name appears to be as the last name character in the credits, and reports that Monty once added the last name Branwen to Yang and Ruby's Uncle Crow on the wiki, at some point, definitely adds to the idea that she's related to Yang, be it her long lost mother, sister, or something like that. However, I will say that if this scene is in fact a real time event, and she indeed is related to Yang, I do hope in Volume 3 she has a bit more of a unique touch to her design, as I, like many, feel she has a bit too much of a palette swap look to her, especially with how quick they got to hint in her true identity.